Good morning, church. Would you stand with me as you're able, as we have the call to worship? The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May God send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May God grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your victory and in the name of our God set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Give victory to the King, O Lord. Answer us when we call. We continue our worship with the Apostles' Creed, found on page 881. I believe in God.
Today's epistle reading is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 6 through 10 and 14 through 17. It can be found in your pew Bible in the New Testament on page 170. Once again, we're with Paul, the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5. So we're always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to be pleasing to Him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive the due recompense for actions done in the body, whether good or evil. For the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for the one who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We no longer know him that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Look, new things have come into being. This, my friends, is the word of God for us, the people of God. As we worship together, we come confessing Jesus is Lord, and we also confess our sins before God and our neighbor. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Friends, the good news is found throughout all the scriptures and particularly in Romans 5, we hear that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners and that proves God's love toward us. So it is in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And as forgiven and reconciled people to God, receiving this gift is a gift that we receive that we must share. And so let us do that now. Let us share the peace of Christ with those who are gathered here this morning. Invite our ushers to come forward. Friends, we love because God first loved us. And we give because we have received so much. One of the ways that we respond to the good news of the gospel is by giving God's tithes and our offerings.
God, we do give you thanks. We know, O oh Lord, that you are the source of all our gifts. Thank you for these gifts and these givers. God, we ask for your wisdom, for your guidance. We ask for your leading that we might be good stewards, that we might be about your business, that we might use these gifts to be about your kingdom on earth in Wilmington as it is in heaven. Amen. Now we're going a little out of order. I wanted you to hear the text from 1 Samuel. Um, the last thing you hear before the sermon. So we heard the epistle and now we're backtracking a bit to 1 Samuel, although we are not in the way in which uh, the fullness of Christ is always before us and especially within scripture. And as we read these scriptures, there is no before or after. There is only the center who is God. And so I invite you to read along with me, if you, would, if you will, if you wanted to read from your pew Bible. Uh, it is on page 248. It's 1 Samuel 15, 34. And if you brought your own Bible with you, you must not be United Methodist. <laughs> so we read these words together. Let us hear a word for our lives from God. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely his anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see, they look on the out, outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. From that day forward, Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
Gracious God, let the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Lord, as the one who stands before you now, I pray that you would use me. That either because of me or in spite of me, still your word will be faithfully proclaimed and your name glorified. Through Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Steve Rogers happened to be the hero of this story, and like many heroic stories over through and throughout human history, uh, this hero story contained the element of uh, sort of the unlikely hero, this underdog. Steve Rogers could not make it into the army, and therefore, uh, being left out, he agreed to be a part of a program where he received serum that made him stronger, bigger, taller, and he became Captain America. So some of you that know the Captain America story, you know I've left out a few details, that's okay. But I just wanted to point that out that unlikely heroes are a part of a trope that is throughout human history. The difference is though, whenever we hear about people that we think are unlikely heroes, is the fact that this unlikely hero, Steve Rogers, had something or did not have something rather that he needed. He needed to be bigger. He needed to be stronger. And so it took some kind of substance, whether you're bit by a radioactive spider or you have some chemical reaction that happens to make you bigger and stronger, uh, there's something that happens that makes sure that you have what you need later. We're part of a world where we are thought to not have all we need. Of course, if we were to retell the story, we remember from last week, uh, Saul was king. Well, he was about to be anointed as king, and you remember that the people were complaining because everybody around them has a king. Everybody does. Everybody has a toy that I don't have. Mom, please buy me this toy uh, so I can be like everybody else. That's essentially what we were hearing from the people. Everybody else has a king. We want a king too. Of course, this distressed Samuel. He tells the Lord and the Lord says, well, I thought that I would be their king. And it's interesting that the God goes ahead with human plans. It's, it's interesting that over and over in, in Scripture, we almost see that the God is willing to work with human plans, even though they may not be what God had in mind. Such is the story that we have before us. Saul becomes king. He does okay. He does okay for a while. And then he wasn't doing okay. And then God, as God does, eventually gets exactly what God wants. And God is willing to work with humanity all the way up into the point where God does, in fact, get what God wants. And so if humanity wants a king, if the people of God want a king, then God is going to teach us a little bit about God's heart. And making someone who seems unlikely to become a king. But I want to say to you that David had everything he needed. He began with everything that he needed. David was somewhat of a renaissance man. He was already tending the sheep. And, and I, we realized that a shepherd's job mate, couldn't be that involved. It couldn't require too much skill to do that. But it does. To protect the sheep. To, to look after the sheep. We, we think that a shepherd is not also a king. There's somewhere along the way that a king is something other than. A king is someone else. But David, the shepherd boy, has other skills. He can play the harp, we find out. He uh, can do things like slay a giant. That'll come next week and we'll pre be prepared for that. David does not need one extra thing that he does not already have or won't be gifted to him because David is the one who's after God's heart. And not because he's after God's heart necessarily. It's just that God seems to take pleasure in gifting each and every one of us. And in that gifting, we're given the opportunity to participate or not. So we come to today's story and we hear that, uh, that Saul is 
uh, is not in God's favor anymore. Samuel, of course, is grieving over this, and he's wondering what in the world is going on. And Samuel probably feels maybe a little bit responsible. He went along with the people. Maybe he should have stuck to God's plan a little bit more. I don't know, but he's somehow grieving. And he doesn't want, because Saul's still alive, he doesn't want to be the one to anoint the new king while Saul's still alive. You can see why he might be trembling with fear. You can also see why the, the people, the elder, elders of Bethlehem are fearful. They want to know, are you coming in peace? Or, or, or is there going to be an insurrection happening? Are we going to anoint a new king and then all of a sudden there's going to be a war that breaks out? No, no. Samuel and God are coming in peace, but... We're hearing a little bit about how God is planning the next step through Samuel. And so as it was and in the story, we hear that most <laughs> of Jesse's sons make it to the sacrifice ceremony. And somehow, some way, not all the sons were there. We I mean, would think that Eliab or Abinadab, who have God in their name or father in their name, would certainly be the people chosen to lead God's people into this next phase of kingdom. But, of course, they weren't chosen. Shama is uh, son number three, and his name means astonishment, and we are sort of astonished that we got even this far, that God didn't anoint the first two sons. I mean, after son number one was rejected, it seems like, well, certainly son number two ought to be. No, it's son number three, and we're starting to get this astonishment that is coming over us of, oh, it's not three, it's not four, it's not the fifth son, not the sixth son, surely the seventh son who is here is going to be the envy of the rest of his brothers, and it wasn't even him. Prompts Samuel to say, well, is everybody here? <laughs> Are all your sons here? No, we forgot to look for God and God's plan somewhere other than. We forgot to look for God within David who's out tending the sheep. Of course, the eighth son, the youngest son, is not going to be the next king. Of course, the shepherd is not going to be the next king, is he? There's something astonishing about this God that we really, I want to say, that all of us don't really pay that much attention to. I mean, how many of us said the Apostles' Creed from memory just a moment ago? You can raise your hand. You don't have to. I'm going to say I, I said it from memory. I learned the words a few years ago. And we say some of the most astonishing things about our faith, and we say it while we're yawning sometimes. I'm not saying you do. Maybe some of us, maybe me, sometimes I'm just going through the steps and I say, yeah, born of the Virgin Mary. How many times has that happened? Not very many. I can only name one. And of course, it comes from an unlikely place. Of course, it comes from an astonishing place. We'll get to that in a moment. What is God doing within this because after all we are encouraged by Paul that we walk by faith not by sight there's something about our physical eyesight that sometimes can betray us that we don't see as we ought to see we don't see with God's eyes we're not able to see into the heart and so it's going to take a little bit of trust it's going to take a little bit more confidence in God to be able to walk, not by sight, but by faith, by faithfulness. It's an interesting thing that happened not too long ago. And as I, I was looking around, I don't think I saw our finance chair here, but uh, I hope we can talk about this at some other point. But I just want to remind us a little story that we've been kind of walking along here as people of grace and people of Grace United Methodist Church that... Uh, we've been participating in a story that became very astonishing, I think, uh, just a few months ago. And we were walking along, and, and part of what we do in our finance committee is we, we start to understand a little bit about where, uh, where we're receiving funding, and uh, that comes from you all, and then uh, where, in fact, we are uh, 
either needing more funding or we got a budget in place and there's certain fixed costs that we have to have and, and we were running a little bit behind and when I say a little bit I mean a lot uh, at some point last year and we were starting to wring our hands over that you know there's a lot of angst and worry that comes along are we going to be able to pay our bills maybe this has happened to you in your lifetime and in your own personal finances I don't know uh, but this is certainly something that was a part of the church but guess what we've been in existence for 226 years and it seems like as I listen to people who've been here for a minute that this has happened again it's happened before we always get into a worry a little bit around you know are we going to be able to and I'm not delegitimizing the worry. I'm just saying that sometimes we worry. Sometimes that worry causes us to wring our hands. And so our best thought at one point was, okay, we got to get more people to come inside the church. And then we got to get more people to give to the church. And then we have to get those who are giving to give a little bit more. And we just, you know, raise ourselves up by the bootstraps to get some things done, right? Now, I, I can tell you as a pastor here... <laughs> That I think the first two are great. Yeah, we would love to have more people join us here at Grace. We would love to bring more people into the life of the church and then have them notice that what we've all noticed is true. Anytime you give yourself away, it's almost like you can't give yourself away that you don't receive something in return, right? This is something about God's blessing that has always puzzled me, that when you try to give yourself away, you try to be faithful to what God is calling you to do, and you do it sometimes in fear and trembling, but you do it anyway, and then all of a sudden you think, oh my goodness, God is continuing to bless. It's giving me new eyes to see how God is working in this. In any case, we we decided to have a radical idea and a radical thought was, you know, let's not focus necessarily on the first three, although we agree that those three things are necessary to encourage people into what it means to uh, receive a blessing by giving. We decided that we were going to give ourselves away, talking about giving. We were just going to start to participate in what's going on in our community. And there's a couple things that were happening. Sunset Park Elementary is a is, is a, a church, I mean, a school that we've adopted uh, many, many years ago. And we decided we were going to step up our relationship with them and, and do and, and, and become more a part of that community. And there's several things that are happening within uh, that ministry of reaching out to our neighbors. And then there was also, uh, we had a chance, we didn't think of this on our own, the warming shelter came to us and said, you know what, we need a space uh, for folks who are unsheltered to spend the night when it's freezing cold outside. This literally saves people's lives to be able to stay in a warm place whenever the temperature is below 30 degrees. And so Grace Church said, you know, we'll do that. Uh, we, we got the facility, we'll, we'll participate in that. Uh, and we started to welcome people in. And, but even before we welcomed the first person into the doors, as we were just participating, and here's a coincidence, and I'm going to say it as a coincidence because I don't actually believe in coincidences too much anymore. The coincidence is that right along this time, when it was in December, uh, we started to take a look at ourselves, and I don't know what was going on within that, but God seemed to bless whenever we started to make a move and toward God, God seemed to bless within that. Because we had the best December I think we've had in recent memory. So much so that we were able to overcome the deficit from the, the year. But not only that, we were able to take money and set it aside after we had uh, given some money back that we had borrowed from our investments. We, we set some money aside because we had too much money in the checking account. Now who has ever had too much money in their checking account? It's a problem. So we set it aside so that that money would be uh, in good stewardship purposes, making more money, hopefully, so that we could do more ministry. Not so that that pot could sit there and get rich and full, but so that we could participate fuller in the life of the church. It was astonishing, folks. And I can't tell you how the math worked out. And I'm sure that someone smarter than me can, can look at a spreadsheet and say, this is exactly how it happened. But I also want to say 
that if we try to work it out in our own minds, we don't leave room for the possibility that God was doing something unlikely and astonishing in the first place. This is exactly what's going on here. <laughs> you think you know what a king looks like? Uh, I, can, I can see a king by looking at the heart. And by the way, the same heart that beats for God is created within each and every one of us. It was David who said, create in me a clean heart because he had at once felt like he had fallen away. And he definitely did. He, fall, he fell away from God. And so David prays for that same renewal that we have the opportunity to pray. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And let the astonishing, unlikely God of love continue to bless. Not that we participate so that we'll be blessed, but we recognize that we've been blessed in the first place. And so now we, give, we have new faith to participate. Something interesting that Steve read, uh, part of 2 Corinthians, we saw that you know, walk by faith, not by sight. A little later it says, we no longer regard people from a human point of view. Let me say it again. We no longer regard people from a human point of view. When we see our friends and neighbors at Sunset Park Elementary, we see our friends and neighbors who are about our community, people that bears the image of God, these are the folks that Jesus has a heart and passion for as well. Remembering that we found the king not in the assembly, but outside. Tending the sheep. It's my friends. It's God's word for God's people. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer together.
God, you are an astonishing God, an unlikely God, a God of surprises and subversiveness. And Lord, we give you thanks today that you are a God who looks at the heart and not so much the outward appearance. Lord, we thank you that you look deeper, that you, that you see past what things look like on the outside. Lord, you're paying attention to what's on the inside. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, that you choose what we often don't choose, that you call people, Lord, that we wouldn't expect, ourselves included. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, that you use what looks to be foolish in the eyes of the world to bring your kingdom, to bring your way, quietly, oftentimes, and in ordinary ways. Lord, we gather this day and we have brought all kinds of stuff with us into the sanctuary this morning. Lord, we bring our own worries, our own troubles, our own baggage. We bring, oh Lord, people on our hearts and minds that we're concerned about. We lift our prayers for all of that today, oh Lord. We pray for loved ones, friends, neighbors who are sick, and suffering. We pray for people around us, O oh Lord, who are in bondage, in body, mind, or soul. We know, O oh God, that we need you. We know that we need your comfort, your strength, your peace, and your presence. And God, now in this moment, we, we name the names that we would like to lift in prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, we know that you heard these names, the ones that we haven't named. We entrust these folks to your care and love. And may they feel your love and our love for them, even now. God, we also pray, we pray prayers for our world. We pray prayers for our neighborhood. Lord, may we continue to follow your lead, to be a light on this very street corner, this place where you have planted your people, Grace United Methodist Church. God, we have also heard in your word and in the hymns today that you are God who is making all things new. Let it be so right here, right here where we are. Yes, we have traveled from north and south and east and west to sit in this sanctuary. But, oh God, we are here on this street corner for a reason. Give us eyes to see. Give us eyes to see beyond outward appearances, O oh Lord. Give us your eyes to see the heart of things, the heart of people, your people, on this street corner. And, yes, beyond God, we are bold enough to pray. We are bold enough and humble enough to pray with confidence. This prayer that you still teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
What we shall be has not yet been determined. It's something that God alone can see. And we pray that the God, the astonishing God of love, who fills us with blessing, may bless you until your cup overflows, that your life is so full that you live it in such a way that those to whom love is a stranger will find in you generous friends. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And go in peace.